Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Indian's program on geriatric psychiatry. Today we have with us Professor Matthew Vergis, sir, who is a professor of psychiatry here at Nimhans. He also heads geriatric clinic and services at Nimhans. He has been uh, in the past head of community psychiatry and also head of the department of psychiatry here at Nimhans. He uh, is also interested in family uh, family psychiatry and he also heads family uh, psychiatry uh, team here at uh, Nimhans. So welcome you uh, to the meeting, sir. Uh, he'll be uh, taking a session on prevention in geriatric psychiatry. So the stage is over to you, sir. Thanks, Chetan. So this is the uh, almost the last uh, penultimate of the series of geriatric psychiatry. We end next week with uh, uh, the legal issues and laws and policies of geriatric psychiatry. Um, so all the major disorders have been covered from September till now. And um, so I am going to discuss today about how we can prevent different uh, geriatric psychiatric disorders. And I think this issue of prevention is very important because uh, you know, considering that we even have large numbers and large numbers of people who have got uh, mental disorders. You can hear me all right, no, Chetan? Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Yeah, this orange thing is still not gone. I think you just leave it like that, no? Yes, sir. You can't do anything, I think. Yeah. The thing which says, please remove this window keeps fading and coming out. So anyway, okay. So um, this is a slide which many of you might have seen from the World Report on Aging and Health in 2015. If you can see India here, you'll see that um, in 2015, we had less than 9% of people who are elderly. And that's what you found even in the census in 20, 2011, the figures were less than 10. Uh, but if you see the next figure as to what will happen in another 30 years time, India will move up to having 10 to 19% of people who are elderly. So that's a projection. So we will go up by, in, in 30 years, we'll go up by almost uh, sort of double. You can see that you know other countries, you know, the the United States and many parts of Europe will actually have more than thirty percent of their population who are elderly. Now, the rate of population aging is going to go up drastically because these countries, the Lamic regions, China, Brazil, India, are the ones that will actually go up very steeply from under 10% going all the way to over 20 to 30%. So as far as the census was concerned, in our 2001 census, we had only 77 million. So it is just 7.7% of the census population, which are elderly. While in the last census, which is now almost 10 years ago, we had 8.6. And at this point of time, we have probably over 130 million people who are elderly, and that by the time we do the next census, you'll probably find figures of 130 or 140 million. So it's projected to go up over 10%. Now, the challenges to population aging is the fact that uh, the fact that we'll have a large population, especially in the Lamic regions, is that the there'll be a change in the old age dependency ratio. So there'll be more and more people who are elderly who need help and who, need, who are dependent on various people, families, society. And because there are changing families and in cities, there is migration, there are nuclear families, there's women's employment. And because of all this, uh, and the lack of infrastructure and trained manpower, we'll have a serious problem as far as uh, aging and healthcare is concerned. There will also be, other than healthcare, there will also be problems in the um, psychological and social issues and cultural issues, but healthcare is what impinges on us immediately. Now, again, we know that 45% of elderly suffer from some chronic disease. Many times it's the 
non communicable diseases but they usually have two or three physical illnesses this is by a survey done by ab day many years ago in in, in delhi they would have vision problems hearing problems and ncds plus the mental illness and uh, i will show you in the next few slides how depression and dementia are the common mental illness so any mental illness is anything from 20 to 30% uh, in the general population and those figures will go up if you are going to go to different places like institutions you know hospitals old age homes and so on um depression might be anything from 10 to 20% so less than 10 in the general population and over 20 30% in the in the hospitals and other setups dementia is anything from from 3% onwards and suicides about 12 per 100,000 in india now the common old age psychological or psychiatric problems are very commonly bereavement and adjustment problems which is again part of this change in the life cycle stages that most elderly face sleep and circadian rhythm problems are again a very common issue based on the national mental health survey in in 2016 anxiety and panic disorders are anything from 3.3% to 3.5 lifetime uh, similarly mood disorders and bipolar depression anything from 3.5 which is a current to anything up to up to 7% lifetime suicidality was anything from 0.7 to 0.8 alcohol and drug problems about 4% and uh, from the earlier surveys on cognition and memory uh, about 3.7% of the population is what you have with various cognitive problems not just delirium not just dementia but also other kinds of cognitive problems like delirium now we need to discuss prevention strategies and i'm i've already said how huge this problem is in terms of mental health and health so we need to discuss really prevention strategies for all elderly now very uh, classically what we have been taught is prevention is primary prevention secondary prevention and tertiary prevention all of us know from our community medicine days that primary prevention is basically to reduce the incidence of illness so that is reduce the new cases that we that we see every year this is usually by health promotion secondary prevention is uh, halting or slowing the disease progression so what is called typically as early detection and treatment tertiary prevention is to reduce disability manage complication and sequela so uh, continued treatment rehabilitation relapse prevention and other things that are important for uh, tertiary prevention as i mentioned prevention is important in the light of growing numbers and here for this presentation i am going to discuss only about primary prevention because most of the secondary prevention prevention and tertiary prevention strategies have already been discussed in all the uh, talks that you heard in the last 3 uh, months so i'm going to mainly discuss primary prevention and primary prevention also in the light of the um, institute of medicines model which is universal prevention selective prevention and indicated prevention now universal prevention is what is done in the general population in people who have no disorder at all a large public uh, health level uh, selective prevention is for people is what is targeted at people who have a high risk for a disorder say for example somebody who is highly uh, likely to get depression or somebody who is highly likely to get um, substance abuse and indicated prevention is for treating people who have mild symptoms so these are usually subsyndromal depression people who don't really have who are just abusing maybe benzodiazepines or abusing alcohol but they don't really fulfill criteria for a syndromal diagnosis so remember this universal selective and indicated prevention and this is the model that this institute of medicines model is what is now uh, looked at in primary prevention i'll cover three disorders here in this talk uh, three conditions rather one is geriatric depression second will be suicide in the elderly and third will be dementia and cognitive disturbances so first of all for geriatric depression all of us know from the earlier classes that geriatric depression people with geriatric depression have got a good premorbid psychosocial functioning 
There's usually no genetics involved, but they have poor response to treatment. They have a poor prognosis. And there are various risk factors, and they're usually accompanied by vascular risk factors, endocrine disorders, neurodegenerative diseases, usually people who are having dementia or Parkinson's disease. These are all people who might have more uh, chances of having depression. Uh, this 5-ST transporter, transporter gene polymorphism is important because uh, if you check this gene polymorphism, again, you can target people who have this gene polymorphism and then predict whether these people might have a risk for uh, subsequent MDDs, recurrent depressive disorders. Um, low omega-3 fatty acids is something that has been postulated. So again, checking for that. And this might be involved in the uh, prevention. Again, looking at various community settings, if the outpatient clinics are about 10%, if you go to emergency rooms, nursing homes, and long-stay institutions, the prevalence of elderly depression goes up. So in uh, long-stay homes, you might even get about 70%. This is uh, Western data. We don't have data from India. So in nursing homes, it might go up to about 50% because uh, the very fact of their environment and also because of different other disorders that they have. Um, Depression with physical disorders is very important, especially with the communicable and the non-communicable diseases. So there might be a fourfold or a threefold increase compared to the general population. So in people who have infected diseases like HIV and tuberculosis and non-communicable like cardiac disease or diabetes mellitus, depression is three or four times more common. And it's important because depression can increase disability, it can increase quality of life, Decreased quality of life can lead to increased healthcare costs. And uh, most of the time, depression is uh, not recognized and you know, under treated. So it's, remember, it's good to remember this because physical illness is another risk factor for elderly depression. So if you look at this uh, diagram from a WC technical report, you'd see that you know, it's anything from, if the general population is less than 10%, anything from a three or four times increase in people who have cancer, diabetes, stroke, and so on. So in people who have, so it's important to target people who have a physical illness. So people who have NCDs or even infective diseases, you know that you must target these people and you must teach physicians, even primary care physicians, that you must look for depression. So this is where it's important in prevention. Uh, late life depression is also a major risk factor for suicide. So it's, it, it's important to look at people who have depression or people who, can, who are susceptible to depression because you can tackle suicide also in this way. I already mentioned that it's more with physical illnesses, it increases mortality, uh, it increases, uh, decreases adherence to treatment. So it's, it's very important for individuals and in terms of cost and uh, societal burden. So again, risk factors, bereavement. So, so many elders who have lost their spouses in the last six months to one year are very likely to get depression. People who have abnormal sleep disturbance. Sleep disturbance is a common thing in elderly. So people who have got sleep disturbance going on for a long time, that can be a risk factor for depression. People who have any kind of disability, prior recurrent depressive disorders are a risk factor. Female gender is more common. Again, involution of the brain, uh, people who have um, mild cognitive impairment, shrinkage of the brain, uh, uh, dementia, Parkinson's disease, other, other neurodegenerative diseases, these are all risk factors. Deficiency of uh, essential nutrients. So that's the reason why when you have elderly people coming with uh, B12 deficiency, you look for that and correct that. People who have uh, other nutri essential nutrients, uh, vitamin D, fatty acids, uh, other drug therapy can influence uh, somebody getting depression. So say, for example, drugs that are given for other things like say statins, um, antihypertensives, some drugs given for diabetes, psychosocial situations very commonly. So uh, losing a job, you know, moving away from uh, children, um, constriction in your you know, family size, you know, these are all things that can cause all you mentioned about physical illnesses, you know, cardiac, endocrine diseases, neoplasia, and so on. So 
universal prevention and depression now what is something that you can promote at a public um, public level is to see that people you know, can have exercise they can become more religious and adopt spirituality uh, to Im- if you improve treatment barriers and access to care so for example getting people in touch with their physicians regular contact with their physicians regular contact with primary care regular contact with the uh, specialists that they go to providing medical reimbursement and insurance so the universal health coverage is a good way to see that you can prevent uh, depression and if you can make physicians um, screen for these disorders in all the cases that they see so you must teach primary care physicians because primary care physicians miss depression and geriatricians fail to de- fail to recognize 50% of the depressions that present to them in in hospitals and uh, the scale that is very good uh, geriatric depression scale is something that is very sensitive the center for epidemiological studies cesd is also something that has been found to be very useful it can be done used even on the phone uh, it is very quick to administer and very acceptable even to our indian patients uh, so you need to educate primary care physicians uh, in this conceptual model to improve their psychiatric knowledge interview improve their interviewing skills uh, and improve their decision making and attitudes as far as mental illness and depression is concerned in their patients so at the universal level this is something that you can do with training of physicians selective prevention for people who are at risk you need to better manage insomnia so early and quick treatment of insomnia and sleep problems problem solving therapy for people who have got medical comorbidities so people who have got a stroke who are diabetes who's got arthritis who got you know other kinds of problems social rhythm rhythm stabilizing therapy for people who have had recent bereavement so if somebody has lost their spouse you can start um, ipt or social rhythm therapy and you can prevent mdd as i mentioned by uh, better education um, adopting cbt in people who are at risk improving stress resilience so you can advise that pe- these people have regular aerobic exercise meditation yoga improving their social supports and networks and problem solving therapy now indicated prevention for people who have got minor symptoms they don't meet the syndrome of depression but they have minor depressive symptoms again improving sleep pattern in the past year because that predicts a relapse um so normalization of sleep pattern either by good sleep hygiene or the advising uh, you know short term say for example benzodiazepines or hypnotics both cognitive behavior therapy and interpersonal therapy has have been used in trials and i'll mention that as we go along screening for low testosterone in males and i already mentioned about the 5 hdt gene and uh, so you can treat with testosterone replacement omega 3 fatty acid uh, replacement and these things can help in people who have got mild depressive symptoms uh, psychosocial interventions that have been researched and this is a mini review this is a cochrane review that is done by osman and others in 2018 uh, the, these are the main psychosocial interventions that were inter, uh, which were researched for primary prevention of geriatric uh, depression and these are skill training so usually simple education cognitive therapy aerobic physical exercise group support reminiscence interventions uh, s- simple social activities like cultural activities gardening stitching these are all been researched and then many of the trials have had multi component intervention where they combine say physical exercise with uh, say cognitive therapy or physical exercise with social activities and so on <clears throat> so if you look at modifiable risk factors and the interventions so from physical illness and disability you can use problem solving therapy uh social isolation you can use uh, an institutionalization you can use uh, increasing social supports and networks in drug abuse you can use close monitoring and treatment for that uh in people who are caregivers say for example we all know that say spouses of people who are caring for somebody with dementia the chance of them having depression and anxiety is as high as 30 to 50%. So you can uh, intervene with the caregivers by providing them respite support, support groups, 
um, teaching people to reduce stress by aerobic exercise, meditation, uh, CBT, simple CBT principles, education about illness and health. Again, I only mentioned about sleep disturbance and controlling risk factors, vascular risk factors by controlling hypertension, diabetes, treating them early, continuing treatment, lowering lipids, advising a good diet and exercise. These are things that you can do for people who have got these modifiable risk factors. Uh, other indicated preventions, um, antidepressants, it's shown that antidepressants or psychotherapy are acceptable and very useful. Um, late life depression, which is mediated by stressors, psychotherapy is something that is very useful, both CBT and IPT. And most people who have major depression, 40% uh, of the cases respond to initial pharmacotherapy and then later on to uh, with pharmacotherapy and psychotherapy, uh, they might respond quite well. This is a recent uh, trial in uh, Goa run, uh, done by Reynolds and others, Reynolds, Amit Dias, Vikram Patel and others. This is, uh, it's called DIL. DIL is for heart, of course, but it's also the uh, depression in late life trial uh, where they used uh, lay health workers to do problem solving therapy, behavioral treatment for insomnia, psychoeducation for the management of uh, simple psychoeducation and education for the management of their medical disorders like diabetes and other things and assisting them patients to get socioeconomic resources, maybe finance, maybe other benefits like insurance and so on. So this is a trial that is sort of ongoing and this is the initial part that, is, that they published in 2017. Now coming to suicide, for Universal prevention of suicide in the general population. Uh, I mentioned to you that this is a big problem. It's about 12 per 100,000 in India. And uh, the risk increases with age. Completed suicide is more in males, in people who are unmarried, who are single, and increases in people who have got alcohol and other substance abuse. Uh, increases where people have got other mental disorders, uh, people who have got other medical comorbidities, especially Disabling, disabling medical comorbidities like say stroke or severe arthritis. And as universal precaution, you can actually train primary care physicians to recognize depression and suicide risk. So you train them to ask for depressive symptoms, train them to ask for suicidal ideation using suicide questionnaires. And in the general, uh, you can have general laws which will, which will uh, reduce access to poisons, reduce access to drugs, uh, firearms, as you have seen, you know, in the case of uh, New Zealand and and and, and in and the United States, and other lethal methods. So you can actually have legislation legislator to reduce the things that can, that people can use to kill themselves. In terms of selective prevention, uh, nursing home residents and medical IP units, uh, you must really uh, you can have indirect evidence for. Uh, uh, sub-intentional suicide. So many times elderly people can just simply refuse to eat. Many times you might find that, you know, you have elders in the house who are 70 or 80. Uh, they might tell you, they may not tell you that you are, they are, they want to die or they're depressed, but they might just refuse food or they might indulge in some self-injurious behavior. So you may not actually get the suicide ideation, but you might have get elders who refuse food or indulge in some self-injurious behavior. So you need to Pick this up in nursing homes and also uh, medical IP units and also homes where there are people who are elderly. Uh, as I mentioned, you can very simply train primary care physicians to administer a simple scale like the suicide ideation scale. Uh, you can have gatekeeper models where you can have uh, gatekeeper models with telehealth services, 24 hour telehealth lines where people can call in or people can call into pl places where there are these homes. You can increase the role of the family. You educate family members that you know elders might have this kind of predilection, and so you might you need to watch them. And uh, early detection and treatment of recurrent depressive disorder. So there are various trials, like the, like the Prospect trial and the Impact trial, which were done, where they found that using uh, asking for questions using telehealth models. And I'll show you in the next slide the different methods that we use. This, this is from a mini review that was done by Zepigno and others in 2019. So the various methods that we use for suicide prevention are uh, primary care physician, identification of depression, 
identifying and asking for suicidal ideas, treating with antidepressants uh, quickly, uh, interpersonal therapy, again, trial by Heisel and others, supportive therapy, trial by uh, Kiosis, phone helplines by Fiske and uh, Arbor. And the outcomes that they look for and the outcomes that actually showed improvement was it reduces depressive symptoms, it reduced hopelessness, reduces su suicidal ideas, and improved social adjustment, improved social uh, activities and, and leisure activities, and they were found more useful in women. So these interventions can be quickly done uh, by primary care physicians and also by in various settings where people are at risk to see that you can reduce suicidal risk and suicide prevention. Now going on to the final part, which is on uh, brain uh, aging and prevention of dementia. And this is something that has been talked of in the last couple of years by the WHO and the Alzheimer's Disease International. This is a slide that all of you are familiar with. You've seen it from Clifford Jack's uh, many presentations. You, so you'll see that the, you need to intervene at 25 and 40 years of age, because that is when this amyloid deposition occurs. If you, you can also intervene at the age of 50, whether it's a memory complaint and you have a, a person with MCI, and I, so I'll tell you different interventions now in the next few slides about intervening young and also intervening with MCI. So both selective, universal, and indicated interventions. So the Alzheimer's Disease International published this report in 2014, where they looked at the different uh, risk factors and whether you could uh, intervene with these risk factors. And all of us are familiar with the various uh, modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. Now, we are interested in looking at the right side of the screen where you can, in, where you can intervene with all these modifiable risk factors. We know very well that you can intervene with um, hypertension, diabetes, vascular disease, um, dyslipidemia, and so on, smoking, alcohol, obesity. And you can also use some of these protective factors. Some of these protective factors are questionable. For example, statins, we don't really know whether they work. Antioxidants, we don't know whether they work. But other things which are on the right side, um, active mental faculties, exercise, possibly estrogen use, wine and other diets like the Mediterranean diet, these are things that are probably protective. Um, if you have depression, you need to treat it because the hazard ratio of, of people having more, more than four or five episodes of depression goes up drastically from 2.7 to 6 percent, six, uh, six uh, uh, hazard ratio. So that means the more number of episodes, the more likelihood that somebody can have depression. So you need to treat the depressive episodes. And uh, a study from our own center showing that in, in people who have got late, late life depression, there is a um, significant uh, lower volume of the hippocampus, both in the right and left hippocampus. So universal prevention as far as dementia is concerned, you need to intervene through the lifespan, not just starting in old age, but also starting right from the time, you know, they say prenatal also with regard to nutrients, but you know, at least in, in, in adult period, taking care of nutrition, education, active lifestyle, so physical exercises, mental exercises, and social exercises. You need to modify cardiovascular risk. And uh, this is borne out by, in, in many of the countries, especially in Europe and also in, 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 um, in the United States, uh, large scale public health interventions for heart disease and stroke. So basically taking care of early treatment of hypertension, diabetes, giving statins, giving aspirin, uh, these might have actually reduced the incidence. And this by given by Karen Ritchie and others, this is something that she observed in 2010 from the various heart disease studies. And uh, the incidence of dementia have actually fallen in some of these countries. So this is what has made the WHO and the, um, and, and the Lancet uh, recently talk about these modifiable risk factors, how we can intervene. So for hypertension and diabetes, early diagnosis and treatment, obesity, healthy diet and exercise, uh, smoking cessation, 
reducing head trauma so um, having large scale laws to prevent falls to wear helmets protective devices for people at risk and for depression early diagnosis and treatment now cholinesterase inhibitors have been trial many times to see whether we can use it for mci the studies show that it's useless so don't use cholinesterase inhibitors for people who have mild cognitive impairment uh, you can only get side effects so the studies are really not useful so don't use it as an indicated preventive strategy similarly with vitamin e and vitamin e and other b vitamins all the trials have failed so really no no place for vitamin e or any of the other vitamins in people who have got mild cognitive impairment but the drug that is showing promise is ginkgo biloba so in indicated preventions um, meta analysis of nine trials using a standard extract uh, given for 12 to 52 weeks in over 2000 patients show that there is a change in the cognition score in the adl score and also uh, mild behavioral symptoms um effect size is moderate there is some clinical relevance so we need to use a dose of over 200 mg over 22 weeks in divided doses so these are from recent trials the cochrane database and also the um, 2010 and 2017 trials uh, reviews systematic reviews by uh, wyman and uan and others the other thing that is useful for mci and you can use as the indicated intervention is cognitive interventions now cognitive interventions have uh, fairly good effect sizes and it differs with different kinds of memory skills uh, what improves is immediate and delayed verbal recall and also attention concentration so any kinds of training which are available paper pencil tasks uh, uh, we can use you know simple things like grain sorting letter cancellation there is computerized programs and you know many programs that are available online you can you've heard of brainy app you've heard of uh, luminosity Uh, these are available sometimes as smart uh, phone apps and uh, uh, my colleagues in neuropsychology kesham and others actually have developed a uh, phone app which they which are now going to trial out in a phd thesis for mci uh, we have done some yoga studies in normal people and maybe this got promise and there are some trials going on about this um, yoga based interventions have shown to improve cognition and sleep quality in normal individual normal elderly So there's a trial that we did showing that uh, sleep improved compared to the. So there's a there's a trial with about 120 people, um, randomized into two groups, weightless and also yoga, 16 each. Showed that you know yoga improved sleep. These are normal elderly by the way. Um, yoga also improved uh, memory on the RAVLT, and also non-memory tasks in the trail making. So it's something that maybe have some promise. So some in, some research from our center in New York. Now on to the um, WHO strategy for dementia prevention and also the Lancet Commission from this year strategy for dementia prevention. And this is the global action plan of the WHO and the public health response to dementia. Ongoing now, three years into it, on into the next five years. So. remember that there are six interventions that you can do for lifestyle and six interventions that you can do for treatment so some of it we already mentioned but these are interventions these six interventions are things that you can do for both lifestyle and for treatment i'll go through them in some detail so physical activity physical activity should be recommended to adults with normal cognition to reduce the risk of cognitive decline the quality of evidence is moderate and the strength of recommendation is pretty strong and that is indeed the reason why the who this year even in, in covid times they have recommended that people should be physically active physical activity can be recommended in adults with mild cognitive impairment to re reduce the risk of cognitive de decline the evidence is not so strong there are trials going on but this is something that can be recommended conditionally so physical activity aerobic exercise is something that can be recommended and all of us know the benefits of exercise reduces blood pressure increases strength 
increases cardiovascular endurance, improves balance, improves lung functioning, improves immune response. It's good for depression and anxiety. It's good to control obesity and dyslipidemia. And what is recommended is about 20 to 30 minutes of moderate exercise daily. So brisk walking about five times a week. Yoga, these are things that can be recommended. Nutrition. Now the Mediterranean diet has been sort of touted. A Mediterranean-like diet might be recommended to adults with normal cognition and mild cognitive impairment to reduce the risk of cognitive decline. Now the quality of evidence is moderate. And the strength of recommendation again is conditional because a uh, more stronger recommendation is that you have a healthy, balanced diet for everybody. Uh, the quality of evidence for this is low to high in different dietary components. So some people talk about a keto diet, some people talk about a protein diet, some people talk about a low carbohydrate diet. There are different kinds of you know, diets that are recommended. Vitamin B and vitamin E and polyunsaturated fatty acids and the multi-complex supplementation should not be recommended. As I mentioned, that um, the evidence for B vitamins, E vitamins, and saturated fatty acids are not really strong. So the recommendation is strong that you did not recommend these things. These are not very useful. So what is it in a diet? Um, low glycemic diet with adequate hydration, high fiber, micronutrients. Uh, in a diet, there should only be about 40%, which is complex carbohydrates. So you need to use whole grains, uh, most Indian diets are very high in rice. That is something that you should not recommend. There should only be a cup of rice or so. Increase in the dals, pulses, um, maybe for non-vegetarians, chicken and fish. So protein should be up of upwards of about 30%. And increase fats. Of course, some, some diets talk about upwards of 20% of fats, but that's really still not recommended. So... Interventions for tobacco. This is something where the evidence is low, but the recommendation is quite high. And the recommendation is quite high because interventions of the tobacco cessation um, are useful for many other things. It reduces heart disease, reduces vascular risk, and so on. So it could reduce cognitive decline and dementia in other ways. So the recommendation is strong. Similarly, for alcohol, interventions aimed at reducing and Hazardous use of drinking is something that should be offered to people with normal cognition and for mild cognitive impairment to, re to reduce the risk of cognitive decline and or dementia. So the evidence is moderate and uh, the recommendation is also quite strong in that sense. Cognitive intervention, this is again treatments now. Um, cognitive training can be offered to old, old adults with normal cognition and with mild cognitive impairment, as I mentioned that the evidence is uh, very low to low, but you know, the trials are going on and the recommendation is conditional. So, but you could use it in people who've got MCI, not so much used in people who've got normal cognition. So telling people to play Sudoku and puzzles may not be, this can be generally recommended, but it's not something that is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's conditional recommendation. Um, improving social activity, there is insufficient evidence that it might reduce the risk of cognitive decline. Uh, social participation and social support are strongly connected to good health and as I mentioned, it's useful for other things like suicide and depression. So this is something that can be promoted in old age, but not really for cognitive uh, improvement. So in terms of habits, which you already mentioned, you know, exercise, no tobacco, moderate coffee and tea, balanced diet, food rich in nutrition, nut nut nutrition sleep hygiene, Again, sleep, uh, sleep of about upwards of 68 hours is something that is now recommended for, for good cognition. And there are trials about this also going on. Mental activity plus minus, hobbies, social activity plus minus. Now treatment of hypertension and diabetes. Again, very strong recommendation. I've already mentioned how it might be useful. And so WHO obviously recommends that we pick up depression uh, and, and, uh, hypertension and diabetes early and treated early. Okay. Weight management, again, quality of evidence is low to moderate and the strength of recommendation is conditional. 
that intervention for midlife overweight and obesity may be offered to reduce cognitive decline risk. And dyslipidemia, again, the evidence is low and strength of recommendation is conditional that management of dyslipidemia and midlife may be offered to reduce risk of cognitive decline and dementia. So we are talking about people treating dyslipidemia in old age. We are not talking about treating dyslipidemia in younger people. That must be treated to reduce the risk of vascular disease. Management of depression, again, um, insufficient evidence, but trials show that, you know, uh, this is something that might be used for management of depression in the form of antidepressants and psychosocial interventions for uh, depression based on the existing um, MHCAP guidelines. Management of hearing loss is again is something that is coming up. Hearing and also visual loss, cataracts. Uh, it's recommended that uh, the hearing loss and visual loss be treated. So, this is a infographic from the Alzheimer's Disease International. Can we reduce it with this? Is something that you can you know, sort of paste in different places. Physically active, follow a diet, challenge your brain, enjoy social activity, look after your heart. So what is good for the heart is good for the brain is the adage. So in summary, last two slides, prevention, you have seen that how if you modify various risk factors, vascular, treat diabetes, hypertension, obesity, educate primary care physicians to screen and treat these conditions, Large-scale public health education about you know, healthy aging and awareness of various disorders, reducing access to poisons and lethal objects, improving access to treatment, universal health coverage, reducing barriers to treatment, screening people who are at risk for the different disorders that I mentioned, detecting and treating people early, especially when they are subsyndromal, using antidepressants for depression and for preventing suicide, Various psychosocial interventions, simple ones, which can be done by you know, healthcare workers or even lay healthcare workers, and active lifestyle, exercise, diet, socialization, spirituality. So WHO has uh, launched this WHO Decade of Healthy Aging, 2020 to 2030. And most of the things that I mentioned and most of the things that are mentioned here on this are basically to talk about healthy aging and healthy aging and uh, Healthy uh, environments, healthy and elder friendly environments, something that we're going to be looking forward to. Uh, Kerala has already declared that they are going to be launching to a healthy um, environment. Uh, Karnataka has also launched this healthy um, aging environment. So we hope to see lots of this. You can see some of this in, on our Vio uh, Manas Sanjeevini website on the geriatric clinic. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Over to you, Chetan. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, opening our eyes into the prevention of uh, geriatric psychiatry. I think uh, if we all also start uh, pursuing uh, all those uh, 12 objectives, the six and six, from now on, probably we'll also be uh, aging healthily. So if there are any questions, the audience can uh, either ask uh, through the chat or uh, the audience who are on YouTube also can ask us through live chat uh, there. So we'll unmute your mic uh, in the Zoom and uh, then you can ask the question. Are there any questions? Uh, is there a law mandating elderly care is the question that is asked by Chandrasekhar. Yeah, there is. There are there are laws. The laws are going to be presented next week. All of us know that there's a Maintenance of Elderly Elderly Act, which actually mandates that you know elderly people have to be looked after. So you'll hear the laws next week. So maybe you should log in next week. There's definitely laws. Lithium and effects on cognition is a question by asked by Dr. Sen. Um, not really, Sen. Now, there were some trials which looked at uh, bipolar disorder patients who had lithium for a long period of time, but the outcome was really equivocal. There is, I know you are talking about lithium, and also there is some talk about fluoxetine, 
um, which might act as you know um, say neuroprotective agents but there's really nothing to indicate that they should be used as agents or drugs there's some evidence that people who have or on antidepressants uh, and treated early for depression uh, their hippocampal atrophy is not as much as people who are not treated early so in when you do structural mri you might find in people who have been through good depression treatment that their hippocampi are less atrophic as a, as opposed to people who have had multiple um depressive episodes which have not been well treated so there might be some evidence that these antidepressants might be uh, neurotropic but we don't know this is now a question from mohammed farooq saying that many retired elderly feel depressed and they die of illness what could be the foreseeable reasons and prevention yeah so we all see in in our own families where we have people who are in their 70s and 80s you will see that many of them obviously many of them will have various physical illnesses diabetes hypertension arthritis you know some bladder problem and so on and you will slowly see that these people become withdrawn and they become um, slowly they stop eating they stop you know socializing they stop talking to people so i think it's important this is where you can do some selective Uh, targeted intervention so you need to educate people who have got people i mean all elderly people who are elderly in the homes whether they have a physical illness or not you need to educate the primary care physicians need to educate them and also ask for depression ask for suicidal ideas ask for cognitive dysfunction and this is something that you need to educate families both at the public health level and also with each family So because these are all people who are at high risk so that is the main sort of push of my talk is that you need to do some public health and selective interventions for people who are at risk no specific particular gene for uh, gene for what for g what is that genetic depression is it yeah so i mentioned this uh, 5st transporter d gene that's something that is implicated and there are some trials where they men- measure the 5st transporter d gene and seen whether you know you can intervene early or find out risk early still in it's not recommended clinically sir i have a question uh, we see a lot of uh, uh, elderly uh, people uh, who are going to uh, say uh, probably late life uh, psychosis or late life hallucinations because of sensory deprivation yeah. so uh, uh, how to prevent uh, this yeah so sensory deprivation is a very common thing to get for people to get organic hallucinosis or even uh, visual uh, and auditory illusions or you know sensory distortions so i think uh, it's recommended that you treat the cataract or the hearing impairment or whatever it is that people have and uh, you can use uh more visual and auditory stimuli to see that you know this thing doesn't happen and um interventions you can use maybe antipsychotics or antidepressants in the initial period of time but that itself is not a good idea to let it go on for a long time so but you need to really um handle the visual and auditory problem Sen is asking any upcoming topic will impact COVID nineteen on cognition in the elderly. No, we don't really have. No, we are not planned one. Brain fog is a common complaint. Yes, I think there's lots of COVID symptoms, so we are not planned one in this series. So, what is the use of community psychiatry in reducing geriatric depression? Uh, again, Dr. Mohammad Farooq. Uh, so, I think all that I mentioned is community psychiatry, isn't it? Yes. So, treating primary, I mean, educating primary care physicians, um, using health workers to intervene with uh, elderly, home visitor programs using health workers. So, a lot of the programs in the national program for healthcare of the elderly 
Um, we have created manuals actually for primary care physicians and also for health workers and nurses, where they can actually uh, do preventive interventions in the homes of people who are elderly, uh, and also in the geriatric clinics. So, uh, as all of us all of us know, the uh, NPHC was launched in 2011-12, but it's still in the process of being ro rolled out all over India. In Karnataka, there are many districts where the uh, National Program of Healthcare of the Elderly Physicians and uh, Healthcare Workers have actually been employed. And uh, slowly our uh, um, geriatric center and also other geriatric centers in, in the country are slowly training them and you know making them more uh, um, adept at training and educating um, family members and elders in the homes. That will slowly happen, hopefully. Any other questions in? Uh... No, sir. There are no questions in the YouTube also. Um... Shushankar, I think, wants to ask something. You want to ask something, Shushankar? You can probably answer it. You are muted, sir. Uh... Shiva, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask the... Yeah, yeah now you unmute. Uh, sir, thank you for the opportunity. I think it is indeed a very enlightening presentation, sir. Uh, I think uh, your years of experience, I think, uh, uh, it comes up, in, it has uh, summarized in your presentation also about yoga interventions and uh, about lay health counselors and also many interventions you, you, know, you summarized it in the in your presentation, sir. Sir, uh, what, uh, what I observed is that by the time the elderly population comes into health contact, any health contact, there is some disability already set in these, in these people. So many interventions like physical activities, all those things which we, are, we, we want them to do are slightly difficult. So yeah. Can you also suggest we have to start these interventions a bit a decade earlier, some in mid 50s or early 50s, so that the as more people are reaching 60 and 80s, even 90s also now, the disability is accumulating every decade. The earlier you start this intervention, it might be better. Uh, this was my, one of the, my observations, sir. So that is the reason for the launch of the decade of the healthy aging, 2020. So this healthy aging campaign is supposed to be rolled out for everybody, all of us, all of you, not for me. <laughs> so people in their 20s and 30s are supposed to be aware of this healthy aging campaign. So I think what, that is what the YMRS and Sanjeevini which you can maybe talk about Shivshankar is, uh, mm -hmm. that is what it hopes to do, isn't it? So YMRS Sanjeevini is uh, an initiative which came out of the Healthy Aging campaign. Yes, and uh, that is something that, which will hopefully not just target elders, but you need to target young people. Mm -hmm. And uh, this body system or this system where you use young people to help elders, especially, you know, go and make visits to elder homes, go and make visits to hospitals, uh, help out with their elderly, you know, uncles and aunts and uh, other people. These are all things which are very useful. And there are a lot of nice programs which have been devised, you know, in the US and UK. Um, and I think uh, Sen is already typing something about that. Department of Health in the UK, yeah. Frailty and Cognition, yeah. Integrated Care, yes. Yeah, so this is something that should definitely be rolled out. So all the young people in this seminar should go and preach about what I've told. What I've told is not just from experience, Shushankar. It's all stuff which has got evidence. What I've what I presented has got evidence. So it's not just, uh, just from my from the top of my hat. I mean, you yourself involved in a couple of studies in prevention management, uh, just uh, yeah. especially in terms of yoga and uh, behavior. Yes. This Bio Man Sanjeevani is actually. Yes. Any want to say anything about this? Uh, yes. This Bio Man Sanjeevani is actually a kind of like a taking a taking a mental health to community care itself. It is akin to kind of like prospect study, impact study in US in in UK, and also to the uh, study in Goa, which Dr. Amit Diaz Vikram Patel have done. So where healthy people having some mental health issues, not they have syndrome or sub-syndrome or sleep issues like that, 
they will be they will be counsel or be treated by a trained health counselors and they will be having some support there if it becomes syndrome then it will be treated by a psychiatrist once a depression has improved then the, it will be again returned to the counselor who manages them like a like a manager like a mental health manager so right. in this way this has really helped in the in, a, in, a, in western studies uh, i think here also with the the lot of scope and uh, uh, chances there in india also to prevent these things not only mental health issues but also lifestyle issues or chronic medical comorbidities the management of these things can also be supported through this uh, platform thank you sir so, dr sen is referring to this program which is uh, integrated care for the elderly there is a program which is launched from the who called the ico which is the, similar to the integrated care of the elderly that sen is talking about sen do you want to unmute and say anything about that Sen is one of our uh, alumni. If you, if all of you know, you may, if people may not know, but Sen is one of our alumni from 20 years ago. Sen, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, for the presentation. I was just listening to you. As I mentioned, it's a great privilege to to listen to you after 20 years. And uh, after working here in the UK for 20 years, I still think uh, Nimand is a wonderful institution uh, to hand and to have people like you. as professors running the department and you are still in the pristine condition as i saw you 20 years ago there is no change except that except for the gray hair so just to come about frailty for the last 5 uh, 6 years uh, the central government has been spending a lot of money into developing services for the elderly so they are planning to integrate care for both um, physical health that is geriatricians who work in the field of geriatrics that is physical health medicine and geriatric psychiatry as such as a combined force especially to provide as shivashankar reddy earlier mentioned you know to look at ways of providing things in the community so that uh, you know we don't need to bring people to hospital because hospital care is hugely expensive just to take someone through the uh, ane itself costs to about 2000 pounds according to the government pounds so it's a massive amount of money just to take them around any just for the basic investigations and then send them home so the the focus is now home first so yeah. and get it right get it right at the first time so if there's an infection which can be treated at home rather than rushing them to the hospital we know that people who have any kind of cognitive impairment starting from mild cognitive impairment to severe dementia anyone getting infection quickly go into delirium and delirium of course has high fatality as well as it involves lots of cost uh, antibiotics uh, iv fluids supportive medication nursing care hospital care so many so this financial implications is looked at how we can reduce that cost that is the government intention but coming back to the patient care for a patient also it's best to provide it at home rather than bring it else bring them elsewhere to a strange environment where they get totally kind of uh, disorientated because the environment is very new and they end up recently you probably know that we are having a lot of patients who developed covid because of the the infection high infection risk in the hospital so they are brought from the community into the hospital and they get infected and die in the hospital so it be the other way around they could be managed at home in the community so that the chance of them dying is less and also the second point is you know death is inevitable for everyone human beings are all mortal so rather than rushing a 85 year old um, with all sorts of comorbidity to a hospital can we manage them and manage uh, a good end of life care in the community that is the frailty overall i should say the beginning as well as at the end thank you sorry yeah. i've taken a few okay. minutes sen you are very right frailty is something that people are looking at in a big way especially geriatricians and frailty is something that this healthy aging campaign is treating is teaching people so exercise and the strength training is something that is very useful for frailty uh, so also might be uh, yoga because yoga is one of the things that is being used now for balance and you know uh, to prevent falls and so on there are again there are some studies going on uh, one of the things that the uh, one of the good thing the plus side of covid is the fact that in in nimans and in, in india 
we have ramped up our tele consults in a big way so that is a plus side of, of covid and i believe that with elder care everything should be in the home so tele consults in the home so we are actually trying as far as possible to not get them to the hospital we have you might have to have a first time consult but even that i think is not necessary because various bodies have shown how we can do a good neurological examination other kinds of examination even a even a cognitive evaluation over the over the phone uh, so getting elderly to the hospital is bad so providing health care at home is a way forward definitely for elders especially during these covid times i think that's a plus point and we are sort of going in a big way providing you know health care for elderly uh, we have you know done our our consults have almost 90% were uh, online during covid and we are we are hoping to continue it like that sir it is same here as well i work as a old age consultant mainly doing dementia assessments only uh, for the luton community in the in, uh, in near london and uh, 99% i should say of the consultations including cognitive assessment are all done online nowadays uh, mainly because of uh, health risk and shielding of our elderly patients so we try to avoid going into their homes if at all possible thank you thank you chetan or you yeah. you Uh, thank you sir thank you uh, for the illuminating uh, presentation and uh, also uh, as i was telling opening our eyes into healthy aging and uh, prevention strategies so that uh, if we uh, all start from now uh, uh, not only because of the uh, healthy aging decade but uh, also uh, because we we'll all become elderly at some point of time so uh, hopefully <laughs> that is if we are alive so uh, if we start prevention strategies from now on uh, or even earlier uh, even uh, uh, as early as early adults so if we start from now on probably we'll have a healthy aging and uh, we'll be fit and fine uh, during our uh, uh, the end days so uh, thank you uh, dr matthew sir for the wonderful presentation and uh, i also like to thank uh, dr shiv shankar uh, who's uh, who has finished his dm uh, geriatric psychiatry here at nimans Uh, for his addition and dr sain uh, sir uh, for your uh, additions uh, from the uk so sorry just uh, wanted to say thank you sir thank you very much one just one last point which i forgot to mention you know most of our elderly are on multiple medications so this is another field which has come up recently is medicine optimization using community pharmacists so that uh, you know not doctors needs to you know check everything pharmacists who have very good uh, knowledge about medication they look at all the in interacting medications and whoever especially elderly can be reduce the number of tablets they are on because we know that most of the educated people like us when we are unwell we start taking medication of course elderly who are in the rural areas they probably don't bother much we know about conditions we take hypertensives you know other multiple medications anyway coming back to the point so the interactions and the multiple medication they are not trying to reduce the numbers of medication and those who need not be on a medication can we stop them early on so get it right the first time is the motto and choosing wisely and the last one is you know investigations you know you don't need to send hundreds of investigations for elderly as and when required and only that is required so these are the points sorry to extra add on to thank you thank you sir thank you very much and uh, now uh, we come to the end of uh, this session uh, before we end the session um, uh, i would also like to uh, inform everybody that uh, we uh, have uh, this is the 11th session of geriatric psychiatry we have 10 uh, previous sessions which are available in our youtube channel nimans indians uh, there are also other um, specialties which are available uh, there in our uh, channel so you can uh, subscribe to our channel and uh, watch all those uh, videos and another announcement which i wanted to make is that uh, from our uh, tele uh, medicine um, unit we are also we have also started something called as uh, help uh, which is uh, uh, as you can see it, it's human rights ethics law and psychiatry so here uh, we uh, 
uh, this time, uh, this Wednesday, we have a session on Consumer Protection Act of 2019. It's a newer uh, act, uh, the challenges and opportunities of that. And uh, Honorable Dr. S.M. Kantikar, uh, sir, who is member of National Consumer Disputes Readdressal Commission uh, at New Delhi, will be uh, uh, a panelist in this uh, session. So uh, I'll be moderating this uh, session. So all are uh, welcome to join this session. So uh, we'll get to know what is uh, happening and how there, there is a lot of confusion regarding this uh, Consumer Protection Act that doctors are not included. Uh, our medical profession is removed from the Consumer uh, Protection Act. Uh, we'll get more uh, details and we'll, uh, uh, we'll get to know more about this uh, from a mem member of uh, uh, this commission itself. So uh, that was one more announcement which I wanted to make. So, and uh, uh, finally, uh, I also like to thank Linux Laboratories for their uh, academic grant through which we are running this program. So thank you everyone. We'll meet you uh, uh, two weeks later uh, on another session from geriatric psychiatry on uh, legal uh, provisions and uh, policies in uh, geriatric psychiatry. Thank you one and all. We'll be ending the meeting for all now.